Anybody uh, traveling for the, the holidays this year, Thanksgiving or Christmas? Uh, my family and I, we're going to take a road trip up to Ohio where my family is from. So you can, uh, you can imagine this, me and my wife and uh, eight-year-old, five-year-old and a two-year-old in a car for about 14 hours. So you can pray for us. But uh, how about you? You ever been on a, a road trip? Uh, I, man, I love road trips. I love being on the road. But think about that, that trip home, right? You know, 10 plus hours of driving. Isn't it that last couple hours that are just brutal? You start to, to doze off. You're tired. You just can't wait to get home and relax. You're tired of driving. And then that moment arrives where you pull into the driveway and you walk into your home and you just feel the release and the peace and the safety. You're back home. You're back in your place. Today, we're going to be talking about repentance. And repentance is, is simply this. Repentance is returning home. Repentance is returning home. We are in the middle of a series called Becoming Whole, where we're looking at biblical transformation. What does it mean to actually truly change? And uh, last week, we began to bring everything together as we started talking about the redemptive pathway And we talked about healing, the need to heal from the wounds that we have received, both big and small, both distant and every day. And we said this last week, you cannot become whole without healing. And this week, we're going to look at repentance. And here's the big idea. You cannot become whole without coming home. You cannot become whole without coming home. And repentance is returning home. So today we are going to start in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to, 8 to 9, and we're going to end up in Psalm 51, looking at what does this repentance actually look like. So you can go there in your Bibles. Uh, if you haven't been with us before, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here, uh, and it is so good to be with you today. Wherever we find you, I hope you are blessed by this teaching, or if you're listening to this at some point later, pray that you would be blessed by this. Let me go ahead and, and pray for our time today. But before we do, I want to talk about something that I'm really excited about. Here at One Hope Church, we are uh, starting, we have started something called 150 Days of Prayer. We, we are coming together as a church to pray, to call upon God, to ask Him. And praying really is uh, less about what we want and more about what does God want? What does God want for us? What does God want for One Hope Church? And so we are specifically praying for three things, for a uh, permanent home, for uh, spiritual health, which is what this whole series is really about, and then ultimately for revival in and through One Hope Church. So if you are part of One Hope, I would encourage you to sign up for a day to pray. You can do that on the Church Center app or at onehope.info and uh, join the many others who have already signed up to pray as we wait and watch what God's going to do in this time. So let me go ahead and pray for our time today, and we will uh, jump into our scripture. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you uh, have pursued us, that you have provided a way, that you have cleared the path to return home through Jesus Christ. And we remember the words of the psalmist who says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And God, we pray today that your Holy Spirit would come and convict us and free us and allow us to step into and walk through the repentant pathway. God, we pray all of this for your glory, for our good, for the growth of your kingdom. We pray this in your name, Jesus, and by your Spirit. Amen. Well, let's look at uh, 1 John. Uh, we're going to look at verses uh, 1 John 1, 5 to 9 today. And we went through this uh, last week we hit some of these verses, and a, and, and a couple weeks ago we hit the whole thing. So just to kind of orient ourselves about what we're talking about today, let's see what John has to say here again, starting in verse 5. It says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We focused on that last week. Today, this week, picking up in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, 
if we walk in the light, that is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so from this text, we have really uh, uh, drawn out the, what I've called the redemptive pathway. So we have an image here for you that really consists of these steps, confessing, uh, grieving, forgiving, and cleansing. And last week, we covered the uh, right-hand side of this as we talked about healing. And today, we're going to talk about the left-hand side as we talk about repentance and what that looks like. So what does, uh, what does this pathway practically look like in our lives? Well, let's start at the beginning. Repentance is needed because a sin has been completed. Repentance is needed because sin has been completed. Sin has created a rift, created a, 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 a division uh, from which repentance needs to happen. And we said last week, you know, we've been saying this the whole series, we don't just have wounded hearts. We do have that, but ultimately we have sinful hearts. We said a few weeks ago that, that sin is a condition and a decision by which we are all find ourselves in, by which we all find ourselves in. And so we need to learn to repent. We repent from the sins, from our, the sins of our heart, our natural inclinations that are, that are focused on us. But we also need to repent of some of the ways that we have responded to the ways that we have been sinned against, from the ways we've responded from our wounds. And so let's just talk about sin again. What is sin? I like the definition, Romans 14, 23. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty convicting. Here's what we read. Everything that, does not, everything that is not from faith is sin. Everything that is not from faith, not from a trusting relationship with God, is sin. And within that, we could say anything outside of God's demands, uh, design, commands for human flourishing is sin. And all of us are born into a sinful condition. We have sinful hearts, sinful and wounded hearts, yes, but sinful hearts. And so as we said, sin is both a condition and a decision. But what are the effects of sin? The effects are sin. Sin always divides and leads to death. Sin always divides and leads to death. Let's talk about this. Sin always leads to separation. It always cr creates division, first and foremost between us and God, and then between us and uh, others around us. And then us and within ourselves, there is a division that kind of happens, a soul fragmentation that happens when we sin, and then uh, uh, between us and the rest of creation. And sin always leads to death. Eventually, uh, that could be you know, our physical death. It could be eternal death. But sin always separates, always divides, and leads to death. The death of anything good and right. The death of relationships. The death of marriages. The death of dreams and accomplishments. Sin always leads to death. And this has been true since uh, the beginning of the world. In fact, we see this in the opening chapters of the Bible in Genesis. This is exactly what God said would happen. We read this in Genesis 2, uh, 16 and 17. God has created everything. He's given everything to the man and the woman, and he says this to Adam. The Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. In other words, and the day that you don't trust in my goodness, in my provision, in my power, in my care for you, in the day that you go your own way, you will experience death. This will lead to death. And sadly, this is exactly what we see play out in Genesis 3, just a chapter later. Adam and Eve uh, ultimately trust uh, in the words of Satan rather than the words of God. They choose their own path rather than God's path. And they do, in fact, experience uh, sin and, and death of the perfect, harmonious relationship that they had with God. And they enter then into a condition of spiritual death. And so there's a rift between God and his creation because sin has separated and sin always leads to consequences. So from the very beginning, I love how the Jesus Storybook Bible puts it. If you haven't read the Jesus Storybook Bible, I would highly encourage you to do it, even if you don't have kids. Here's how it captures the idea here. It says this, God speaking to Adam and Eve, you will have to leave the garden now. God told his children, his eyes filling with tears, this is no longer your true home. It's not the place for you anymore. 
God is, is deeply grieved by our sin. And so he, he, he leads Adam and Eve. He casts them out of the garden. And ever since then, every one of us have been born outside of the garden, east of Eden, outside of our true home, which was fellowship with God, relationship with God. And so there's a need for repentance, for restoration, for reconciliation. This is the condition of spiritual death, a broken relationship with God, that we no longer trust him, that we only trust in ourselves. And as we continue to sin day by day, the separation continues. Because you see, Genesis is not just about what happened. It's about what always happens. It's happening right now. It happens every day. And so what happens? God has given us a way to know that we have sinned. He's given us a way. Do you know what it is? Well, it's our emotions again. Our emotions are the cry of our soul, the the, uh, warning lights on the dashboard of our souls. And specifically, we're talking about the feeling and the sense of guilt. When we sin, we experience guilt and shame. And we may think that's a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing. Guilt shows us that something is off, that we've transgressed, that we've stepped outside of God's blessing. And it's meant to draw us back to God. It's meant to draw us back to God. Because what happens is when we sin and we feel guilt, there's, there's only two directions we can go. We can either run away from God or we can run to him. Which way are you running? Where do you run in your sin? Why is that? Why do, we, why do most of us, especially in our natural condition, we run away from God? Because we don't trust him. We fear him. We can't bear the thought of being in the presence of someone so good and righteous and perfect. We think he's not going to love us anymore. We think he's not going to accept us. We've bought into the lie that Satan has fed us, that there is darkness in God. That God won't love you, that God won't accept you. This is our natural response to guilt and shame. We run away from God, and we've been doing it from the beginning. We see it clearly in Adam and Eve. Look at Genesis 3, uh, verse 7 and 8. So they eat of the tree, and then it says this, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were were naked. They experienced the exposure of sin. They experienced guilt and shame. And so what do they do? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They try to cover their sin. They try to take care of it themselves. They try to hide it. Verse 8, and then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of day as he normally would, spending time with his children. And what do they do? The man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So in their shame, in their exposure, they run and hide from God. They hide from God amidst his own creation. And we've been doing the same thing ever since. What do you do? What do we do? We run away. We try to hide. We try to cover our own sin. If we're confronted, we deny it or we blame shift, just as Adam and Eve did. God comes to Adam and he says, what is it you have done? And Adam says, it was the woman you gave me. She made me do it. And then God says to the woman, what is this you have done? And she says, it it wasn't me. Satan deceived me. And so we've been doing this for all of human history. We try to hide. Uh, We we, uh, blame shift. We deny and we try to cover our sin but we can't. We can't cover it ourselves. And repentance is an invitation back to God. It's a call back home because Jesus has cleared the path back for us. Jesus provides the covering for us. And even in Genesis 3, God sends him out of the garden, but doesn't send him out without a promise, doesn't send him out without hope. Here, let's look at the Jesus Storybook Bible again. They capture it well. Here's what he says. Even though he, God, knew he would suffer, God had a plan, a magnificent dream that one day he would get his children back. And one day he would make the world their perfect home again. And one day he would wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, God is calling 
out to you. He's calling you back home. He says, come home right now at this moment. In this sermon, he is calling to you. Wherever you're at, wherever you're running, no matter how far you've gone, he calls you to come back home. It's just like the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. Right? The younger son, he, 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 he runs away from home to live a life of, of sin and debauchery. And when he finally comes home, the, the father rushes out to meet him with joy and compassion. And you can just imagine until that day, the father, he goes out on the porch every day and he looks off to the horizon waiting for his son to come back home. And you need to know that God is waiting for you. God is waiting for you. He hasn't gone anywhere. It is us that run away from God. It is us through our sin put obstacles between us and God. Repentance is deciding to return home again. It's a decision we make because of the conviction of sin and the condition we find ourselves in. It's a decision we make to return back home, just like the prodigal son, to stop running away from God and turn around and run towards him. And do you know what hell is? Hell is the result of never turning back. Hell is the result of never returning home, but continuing on in your own way. And the only place that leads is to darkness and to despair what Jesus calls weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you've ever read C.S. Lewis's classic, uh, The Great Divorce, he captures this idea that ultimately anyone who finds himself in hell is there because they've chosen it. They've chose to keep running away from God rather than coming back to him. But repentance is God's invitation to come back home. And so what does this look like? How do we repent? Well, it begins with confession, confession of sin. And confession is just to acknowledge it, to call sin, sin. It's to walk in the light, as John says. It's to say these words, I did this and it was wrong. I did this and it was wrong. And this can be so difficult because we don't want to be exposed. We don't want to be seen for, for how we truly are. We don't want to feel the shame. We don't feel like we're not good enough. It makes us feel weak and, and shameful and, and scared to be fully known. And the enemy goes to great lengths to keep us in the dark. He whispers to us that you will not be accepted. You will not be loved. He tells us that you're the only one struggling with this kind of sin or to this depth. He tells us that you can overcome it. You can pull yourself out. Just keep trying harder. He tells us, do it tomorrow. Surely it can wait one more day but they're all lies. It's all deception. And when we buy into it, as First John said, we deceive ourselves. Because Satan knows the power of stepping into the light. When we step into the light, when we experience confession, a tremendous weight is lifted from us. To be fully known and fully accepted in the midst of our sin is a transformative experience. I said this a few weeks ago, but we used to run a group here called Restoration Group. We had men's and women's group in a safe, redemptive community where people could come and, for the first time, step into the light with their sin and their shame. And just doing that was transformative. The weight that is lifted. And Jesus says this in John 8, 32. If you tell the truth, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Do you want to experience freedom? And what happens when we don't confess is sin continues to eat away at us, which drives us into more sinful solutions to deal with the pain and the shame of that. Listen to David in Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. Here's what he says. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through all my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. When we remain in the dark, it eats away at us and it weighs down on us. But God invites us to confess, to step into the light. And confession is first to God and then to those whom we have sinned 
against. Listen to Psalm 51. Let's look at how, how David walks this out in Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4. Here's what he says. Confession. I know, for I know my transgressions and my sin. It is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Confession is acknowledging sin and to whom we have sinned against, and here it's ultimately against God. It starts there, and then it moves horizontally. But confession, I mean, repentance is not mere confession, but it's also the expression of grief. True repentance comes from the heart, and it grieves the sin. It says, I did this, and it was wrong, and I'm sorry. I did this, it was wrong, and I am sorry. It's what Paul calls godly sorrow. We looked at this the other week, 2 Corinthians 7.10. He connects it to repentance. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And so there's two kinds of sorrow here. Godly grief is a deep remorse of sin that comes from the center of who we are, while worldly grief is just grieving the consequences, grieving the fact that we got caught. And this is all over our culture, right? I mean, if you have kids, you see this in your kids. And this is maybe one of the most important ways we can disciple our kids. You know, they sin against each other, and we tell them to, to say you're sorry and ask for forgiveness. And a lot of times it's, yeah, I'm sorry. There's no real heartfelt uh, uh, sorrow for sin there. And so I have to invite them and to grieve the effects of sin, how this hurt the other person. How would you feel if this happened? And so in my house, we would go through this process, and then I always make my girls, uh, you know, have a hug, do a hug of, of reconciliation afterwards. And that, that usually helps. But some of us, we never grow out of this phase. We just express sorrow for consequences. We just express sorrow for getting caught. In our culture, because we're writing out sin from our vocabulary, we miss the joy of repentance, the joy of God's grace for us. And so we experience sorrow for sin by confessing sin to God and to others. And if you've ever had to confess sin to someone you love, your spouse, your significant other, it is a difficult experience. But we need to grieve. We need to see and feel the effects of our sin because that will bring us to the end of ourselves. And it caused us to cry out for God. Look at Psalm 51.8. There is a hope of joy in the sorrow. At least what he says in verse 8. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Grieving sin, seeing sin as it is, brings us to the end of ourselves. And we cry out for intercession of sin. We cry out to, to God to help us, that we can't do it ourselves. See, repentance is an appeal to God for mercy and grace based on God's character. It's how David starts off Psalm 51, verse 1 and 2. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to what? Your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, forgive them. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. The experience of being cleansed, of washed. This is only something that God can do. And so repentance says, I can't do this. I can't fix myself. I can't cleanse myself. I can't change myself. God, would you transform me? Would you do it? Look at verses 7 to 12 in Psalm 51. And this, is, this is great. This is amazing. Here's what he says. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. There's forgiveness there. Listen to this in verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, a right heart. O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Verse 11. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. David is crying out to God, would you utterly transform me? This is all in your hands. Don't leave me. Don't, don't leave me here. Don't, don't take your spirit away from me. Give me a willing spirit. This is the heart of repentance. And why is it that David can do this? Because he knows who God is. He knows who 
God's character. And he knows it from God's word. And so we come to God's word to meet God, to know God. And, and David would have known uh, the, the name of the Lord that was revealed in Exodus 34, 6, and 7. He would have known this as we read. The Lord passed before Moses here, and he, and he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love, his chesed for, for, the, for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is the hope, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. What we see here is God's perfect character. He's perfectly just, and he's perfectly loving, and his love will not fail. And what we see is that God's mercy and God's justice meet at the cross, where God's love is most supremely shown to us. You see, it's the cross where sin is forgiven and justice is enacted and the path is cleared back home. That Jesus has cleared every obstacle from our path to God so that we can come back home, so that we can return home. I love how Peter puts it. He says, he, Jesus himself, he bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's repentance. Die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And listen to this in verse 25. For you were straying like sheep. We were all running away, going our own way. But now you have returned to what? The shepherd and overseer of your souls. Repentance is returning home to God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ. And so what we need to do is receive it. It's called appropriation. What Christ has already done for us. We're beholding Christ, but we take hold of what Christ has done for us. We have to experience the forgiveness of God. Repentance is, it involves experiencing God's mercy and grace at the foot of the cross. Experiencing the forgiveness offered for sin. And it's one of the most powerful experiences any of us can have. The forgiveness of of sin, experiencing God's pardon for our sins, his love in the midst of our loathing, seeing his face in the midst of our folly. You see, he dealt with sin, all of it, and it no longer can separate us from him. Listen, Jesus died for your sin. He died for your sin, great and small, for you, for the sin that you need to confess, that you need to grieve. See, we deserved death, but we get mercy through the cross. God's love, that he loves us, he accepts us, he paid it all, all sin, past, present, and future. He made a way back home. You see, God hasn't gone anywhere. We have run away from God, and he's calling us back home. I love Isaiah 57, 14, and 15. Let me just share this. With you. I've, I've been thinking about this verse for, for a couple weeks now. Here's what he says And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way. Listen, remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him, listen to this, who is of contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. This is God's promise. And it comes true through Jesus Christ for you and me and opens the way to repentance. And as we experience the forgiveness of sin, we also experience the cleansing of the defilement of sin, the washing away of our sins. As John says in 1 John, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is an amazing experience. To see and experience your sins washed away, to be renewed and rejuvenated and restored. This is what repentance is all about. And I can tell you from my own life, early on in my Christian walk, uh, 
um, struggling with sin, as many of us do, struggling with lust, and one day just feeling such guilt and such sorrow for sin, literally laying on my face, praying to God, confessing and grieving, and hearing him say, just having this sense, he said, my love for you has not changed. And nothing could change my love for you. That moment changed my life. That experience of forgiveness and cleansing changed me. This is what repentance is. It is experiencing joy. It's, experience, it's coming home to God the Father. And it results in adoration, multiplication, and restoration. Let me just talk about these briefly. What is the result of repentance? All adoration, joy, and worship. All true repentance is joyful. So when you think about repentance, do, do you think about joy? The joy of coming home, the joy of experiencing relationship with the Father. And it involves worship worshiping and praising him out of the great gratitude in our hearts. Psalm 51, verse 14 and 15. Deliver me from blood guiltlessness, O God, blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. When you experience this, you cannot help but worship him and praise, which leads to multiplication. Verse 15. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. When you experience the power of repentance and transformation in your life, you can't help but tell others about it. He says, I'm going to teach them how to repent. And so ultimately, you cannot lead someone where you haven't gone yourself. And so to experience the forgiveness and cleansing of sin and to lead others through that, it's the multiplication of ministry. And finally, it leads to restoration. It opens the door to reconciliation and restoration Psalm 51, 18 and 19, he closes out here. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, and then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, and and bulls will be offered on your altar. This is right worship. When we've done the work of repentance, we can worship God again, and things are restored, and God can build up. It allows for fellowship and community, because in this we can go to those whom we have sinned against, and we can practice repentance. And they can experience healing. And when we get into these, these rhythms of, 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 of repentance and healing, it's an amazing, it's a redemptive, it's the redemptive community that we were meant to be. And it's a beautiful picture. And it's so attractive. It's something that the world cannot get. And when we do this as a church, when we experience transformation, God can do great things. And this is my sincere prayer for One Hope Church. That we will learn and and we will lay the spiritual uh, foundation of transformation and God's going to do great things. So let me close by asking you a few questions here. What do you need to repent of? What have you been unwilling to repent of? Will you walk in the light and experience the transformative power of God's mercy and grace in the midst of a redemptive community. Ultimately, it's this. Will you come home? Will you come home? And maybe for some of you, this is the first time that you've been running away from God your whole life. And right now, you're being called back to your creator, that he might become your father. And I would encourage you to take that step and come back to God. You can do this today. Work this out with God. Work this out in community and come home. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have you've made a way for us to be forgiven, to experience true repentance. And I pray that we would step into this and that we would feel the joy of repentance and the worship and the adoration and the fellowship and the restoration that can come. God, would you heal this land? Would you work through One Hope Church? Move us into the redemptive pathway to experience your goodness and your love and your mercy and your grace. God, we love you.
We pray all this in your name, Jesus, and by your spirit. Amen.